Great. Again, hi, everybody. My name is Rebecca. My pronouns are she, her. Welcome to the Open Oregon Birders WhatsApp group monthly events. We're very happy for the opportunity to connect with y'all and spend some time talking and learning about birds. This evening, our guest speaker is Daniel Farrar. He is based out of Florence, but grew up in Veneta. He is a faculty research assistant for Portland State University. Daniel received his BS in ecology and evolutionary biology from U of O in 2008, though his very birdie career began in high school with field trips to Malheur and continued as an intern for the Institute of Bird Populations in California. And his favorite group of birds are shorebirds. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask Daniel some questions afterwards. So please keep pen and paper handy. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Daniel. All right, um, do I have screen sharing? I made you co-host, so yes, you should be able to do that. Should be at the bottom. Okay, there we go. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you, Rebecca for organizing and setting up this evening. Uh, and thank you, Jack, for hosting. I think he is here hosting. Um, oops. My name is Daniel Farrar. I am with the Oregon Biodiversity Information Center. We are part of the Institute for Natural Resources at Portland State University. And I just wanna give a, a quick shout out to the whole Plover team at Oregon, because it's not very big. On our team is our director, Eleanor Gaines, and then field biologists, Dave Lawton, Kathy Kastenline, and Mary Lee. A special thanks to Dave and Kathy. They are mentors of mine and taught me most of what I know about snowy plover biology. So tonight I'm gonna to be talking about, I don't know how to get rid of this screen. Tonight I'm gonna to be talking about snowy plover demography in Oregon. Demography is just a fancy word for the study of populations. So I'm gonna be giving a overview of snowy plover biology, the populations in Oregon, how we got there and where we hope to be going. So why talk about snowy plover demography? Sorry, my uh, screen not so very well here and I need to minimize you all. Okay, that's better. Uh, we're going to talk about snowy plover demography because we are in the midst of a biodiversity crisis globally. There are similar problems across most taxonomic groups. So in this slide, which is not at all a slide of snowy plovers, we have on the left Martha. Martha was the last known passenger pigeon. She sadly died in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914, so none of us will get the privilege of seeing one of those birds. And so we want to try to prevent that thing, that type of thing of happening with future species, including things like the top right, which is a monarch butterfly, and the bottom, Oregon State bird, the western meadowlark, both of which have seen serious population declines in recent years. But the snowy plover in Oregon is a conservation success story. And so here we have a picture of a, a, a female plover. You can see that they're much drab. They're very drab compared to males. We'll see a picture of a male soon. And we have a range map of the Western snowy plover across North America. And contrary to some beliefs, there is actually only one subspecies of snowy plover in North America. So any plover that you see in the United States is going to be a Western snowy plover. There is this little outlier group over here in the Caribbean, and there's some pretty recent genetic work that argues pretty well for that to be split into a third subspecies. And there's actually some genetic differentiation between this Eastern population of Western snowy plovers and the Western population of snowy plovers. So far, there's not enough genetic differentiation and there's enough gene flow between those two groups that they're not able to split them into their own subspecies. And the second subspecies occurs on the west coast of South America. Tonight, we're gonna mostly be talking about snowy plovers along the very west coast of the United States and Mexico. And this 
segment of the population was listed as threatened by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in 1993 and is considered a distinct population segment. By the early 1990s in Oregon, there were fewer than 50 plovers along the entire Oregon coast. So there were very few birds on the Oregon coast not that long ago. So let's talk a little bit about some snowy plover biology. The snowy plover is the world's smallest plover. For reference, they're a little bit smaller than a robin, a common bird that most folks know and are very familiar with. And snowy plovers are present year round in Oregon, especially along the coast. Some of those birds are short distance migrants and they will migrate down to California, but others are actually resident birds and they remain in Oregon on the coast throughout the winter. And just like you saw in that last slide of distribution, there are Eastern and Western birds in Oregon. And the East Coast population is a fully migratory population in Oregon. And so those birds migrate out about this time of year and they migrate down to Southern California and Northern Baja for the winter. The snowy plover is adapted to open a fennel environment. And they rely on crypsis or their camouflage and to stay hidden from predators and early detection of those predators to be able to get away. Snowy plovers are actually little predators themselves, and they feed primarily on invertebrates on the beach. And these invertebra invertebrates include things like amphipods, the little beach hoppers that you see when you're out at the beach, various flies and marine worms, and a whole list of other invertebrates that I'm not going to bore you all with tonight. They primarily hunt for these species at the water's edge and also in the rack line. The rack line is that, that row of debris you see on the beach that's created by the high tide line. The average lifespan of a snowy plover is just under three years. So they're a relatively short-lived species. And this particular picture here is a, a really cool bird. And this is a male snowy plover. You'll notice he has the dark markings on the neck and on the eye and the forehead. And he's much darker than that previous picture that we just had seen. This guy is one of Oregon's oldest plovers ever, and he's the oldest plover that's currently known to be in Oregon. And just yesterday, in fact, he turned 15 years and two months old. So he's quite an outlier from that average lifespan of 2.9 years. And the interesting part about their lifespan is that they have a pretty high predation rate when they're younger and they're trying to figure out life still. But if they can make it past that average of 2.9 years and get to the five year or so range, they can actually live pretty long. And we have a good number of birds in Oregon that, that have made it over the 10 year mark. So more on breeding biology. Uh, here we have a couple, a couple cute pictures. One is uh, of a freshly hatched net nest. And so you can see how camouflage the chick and the eggs are to their surrounding environment. And a little funny uh, snippet, female snowy plovers leave their mates as soon as the chicks hatch. I'll call, um, so they're ground nesters. They almost always lay three eggs on the ground and they create a small depression that we call a nest scrape. And this depression is about the size of a baseball. So imagine taking a baseball out to the beach and dropping it into the sand and then picking it up. And that little depression that the baseball made is about what a snowy plover nest looks like. They will also sometimes line that nest bowl with, or nest cup with little small white eggshell fragments like you can see around the nest in this picture. And we believe that is so that they can break up the shape of the eggs and the chicks and make their, make their nest area more camouflaged than it already is. Once eggs are laid, both parents, the, the male and the female, share an incubation duties. Incubation takes about 29 days, so the, the eggs are laid, and they're not laid all the same day. It usually takes about three days to lay, and then 29 days from the second egg until they all hatch, and they generally hatch pretty synchronously, and there's advantages to this, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, during the daytime, the female generally incubates the eggs. As you'll recall, she's a little bit drabber than the male. 
and her back coloration is very well suited to match the color of the sand. And so she's a little bit harder for predators to detect during the daytime, and that keeps the nest a little bit safer. And then the males, meanwhile, with their more bold markings, they'll sit on the nest during the nighttime. And by sharing duties like this, it allows both parents to go feed and take care of themselves and get the rest that they need. Once these eggs hatch, and, and as we mentioned, they all hatch simultaneously, they generally want to get away from that nest as fast as they can. And usually what happens is the female snowy plover at that point will abandon the brood and she'll go off so that she can re-nest with another male from a different area. Um, and, and that way she can have multiple nests per year. Uh, and so that brings me to a little story on a couple of birds that I know from the 10 Mile Creek area of Coos County. Uh, each of our birds are banded, which we'll talk about later. And these particular birds were the male is banded yellow, white, red, and green, and the female is banded yellow, white, and yellow, green. And that was just a total coincidence. And so those two birds actually hatched at 10 Mile Creek, but hatched on opposite sides of the creek from different broods. And then the next year, they went off to different sites to try to make a living for themselves and to try to find a new territory. But for whatever reason, it didn't work out on those new territories. So both birds returned in their third season back to 10 Mile where they met each other. And they paired and they successfully hatched a nest. And once a pair successfully hatches a nest together, they tend to stick together with each other year after year. And so this pair, both were long lived birds. The male ended up living 15 years and the female ended up living 12 years. And every year that she was alive, those two birds actually mated together. And so they had a love affair that lasted 11 years on the beach in Coos County. Pretty amazing. Once those little eggs hatch and we have a little, the cute little chicks that you see there, the chicks are precocial. So when I say precocial, think of chicken chicks. They are born fully feathered and they are able to get up and run around and feed themselves within just hours of hatching. And so mom takes off, but they still need dad to take care of them and watch out for them. And so dad does several things for them. He leads them away from that nest pretty quickly, and that's why it's important that those eggs hatch together, because they don't want to stay at that nest site if they don't have to, because it's much easier for them to hide if they get away from that area and can spread out from each other a little bit. So he'll pretty quickly lead them to food sources where he does not feed them, but he just shows them where to get the food, and they do all of the capturing and eating on themselves. It's pretty amazing to see. He'll also do a thing called brooding them um, because when chicks are born, they have a really hard time thermoregulating themselves. In other words, they have a hard time maintaining the body temperature that they need to, to stay alive. And so he'll keep them warm. And the way that works is the chicks will come to him and they'll kind of nestle up into his chest and they'll get under his feathers and they'll get onto his brood patch. And that brood patch is a vascularized piece of skin that allows him to keep the chicks warm. And females have this as well. And it's also how they're able to incubate eggs and keep the eggs warm. One of his other primary duties, and maybe one of his most important duties, is that he acts basically like a for the chicks. And so he is constantly on the lookout and very aware. And so if you're ever out the beach and you see a male with chicks, you'll notice he's very active, looking very alert, doing a lot of head bobbing, trying to judge distance. But his job is to alert the chicks of predators. And a lot of times that predator is me to him. Unfortunately, they don't feel about me the way that I feel about them. And so he'll stick with these chicks until they get to fledge age, which takes about 28 days. And they can't always fly at 28 days. Sometimes it takes a little longer, more like five weeks. So sometimes he'll stick around a little longer than that, 28 days or four weeks, um, and as long as six weeks in some cases. But once the chicks fledge, the dad also is able to go off and find a new mate, because remember his mate went off to find a mate at a different site most likely, 
and he's able to find a new mate at his site because males really like the sites where they where they raise chicks and he's able to attempt a second brood in that same year the chicks once they fledge are pretty incredible if they survive the winter they will actually return and try to find a territory of their own not necessarily at the same site sometimes they'll go to other sites but sometimes they do return to the site where they grew up and they'll actually end up trying to breed and have eggs before they even reach one year old so this is a high risk, high reward ground nesting strategy. They lose many nests and many chicks to predation and weather, but they're able to re-nest readily and have multiple broods per season. So typically if a nest is failed due to predation or weather, that pair will stay together and they'll attempt another nest and they can do this multiple times throughout the season until they're successful, at which point that's when the female will typically leave. So you might be asking yourself, if they're so good at nesting and they're able to have multiple broods per season and multiple nests per season, then well, why are they in trouble? Well, the reason is multiple and there's, there's three big reasons for that. And those three big reasons are habitat loss, human disturbance, and increasing predation. So let's talk about those in a little more detail. And this is a, a, a brood that, that hatched just this year at Silk Goose and decided to pose for our quick little picture before we banned it. So one of the main reasons that they are in trouble is because of the introduction of non-native and invasive European beach grass. And you might be wondering, why did we introduce this non-native species? Well, 90 years ago, as the West Coast was being developed, it seemed like a great idea to be able to go out to the coast, because as you all know, we have a beautiful coast in Oregon, and people like to go out to the beach, and they like to have roads to get out to the beach, and once you travel out to the beach all day, you don't necessarily want to go home, you want to stay in a house or in a hotel, and so cities were popping up on the coast, and so <clears throat> we introduced the grass actually to stabilize the dune so that we can have those things out on the coast. But unfortunately, we weren't really aware of plover ecology at the time, and we weren't really aware of what kind of negative impact in the long term it would have. So what is good habitat for us? Well, they like wide open beaches with very sparse vegetation. And this is a great picture of that. You can see that there's vast amounts of sand and there's just little patches of vegetation here and there. And those little patches of vegetation provide great camouflage for the plovers and for the chicks, but they provide very little cover for the predators. And unfortunately, most of the Oregon coast does not look like this anymore because of the introduction of that grass. And so the picture on the right is a picture of what a lot of our beaches look like today. And and this change, this alteration was caused by the introduction of that beach grass, which is very unsuitable for the plovers. The beach grass, as it grows, forms a very dense mat of grass that the chicks are not able to navigate and that the adults cannot lay. In. And as the grass grows and is continually covered by the sand, because it's always windy at the coast and the sand is always blowing, it covers up the, that grass and that grass wants to keep growing. So it will keep growing above the sand and in the process will create these extensive networks of roots. And, and these dunes can build quite high, 30, 40 feet in the air sometimes. And it creates this very steep fore dune, which you can see right here. And that steep fore dune is not navigable for the chicks and it also provides cover for predators and allows sneak attack from predators. And so some of you may have seen this with predatory sp avian species, just out bird watching, where they'll use some sort of cover to do a sneak attack, like a peregrine falcon or a northern harrier, et cetera. And what they'll do is they'll come from the east side, and I don't have a big enough picture to really show that. And they'll very quickly, drop over that cliff and then try to surprise any prey species like a snowy plover that are down there on that narrow strip of, of beach. The second cause of why they are in trouble is because of human disturbance. So remember that like we talked about earlier, snowy plovers rely heavily on being cryptic 
and being camouflaged with their environment. The adults are camouflaged, the chicks are camouflaged, and the eggs are camouflaged. And so when people go out to enjoy the beach, and if, if they're in an area where snowy plovers are nesting, it's very easy to step on and crush a nest or a small chick. And the reason that this happens is because the adult plover is here, here you see a picture of an adult male. They are, their natural instinct is to run from predators and, and to basically leave their nest unattended while a predator is around. Because it's much harder for a predator to spot those camouflaged eggs or chicks than it is for the predator to spot that adult. So when he sees a predator coming, he'll run away. And so it's very unlikely that you're going to find a snowy plover nest by seeing a snowy plover run off of it. It's much more likely that that snowy plover is going to see you before you see it, and it's going to take off and leave those eggs and chicks exposed. And while they're exposed, it also opens up the possibility of the chicks and eggs being exposed to the weather. And this can have very negative consequences for both. Windy conditions can actually bury eggs and they can bury chicks. If it's too cold, the eggs can, can get too cold and become inviolable. Chicks, remember, they cannot regulate their own body temperatures. They, they can actually perish from getting too cold. And also, when things like storms come along, you can potentially get hail damage to the eggs or you could get chicks that can become very wet. And when, when you're very wet, it very quickly removes your body temperature, your, the heat from your body. <clears throat> and so all of these things make chicks and eggs very susceptible when they're being disturbed by humans. The third aspect to why snowy plovers have declined in Oregon is because of predators and in particular synanthropic predators. And that's just a fancy word for predators that benefit from human presence. And so the primary predators that we're concerned about out on the beach are things like crows, ravens, and red fox, all of which do very well around humans. And so right here we have a quick little video and this is going to illustrate just how effective those predators can be. And this is a raven depredation. And so you see in the circle, there's a snowy plover sitting on a nest. And this is a time lapse video. But this whole event only takes about 90 seconds. It'll be much quicker than that on your screen. But you'll see how this works. You can see the snowy plover constantly looking around for predators. And when that raven comes, it runs away to try to hide. But the ravens are very smart and they're very efficient predators. And I'll play it one more time because that was quick. And so the raven is able to actually spot that snowy plover leaf, and then it's able to go right up to where that nest was, take an egg and then quickly return and take the other two eggs. And so all of these factors are very intertwined and, and the, the predators have an easier time because there's less habitat and there's less habitat because of the human disturbance. But snowy plovers are survivors and they are well adapted to their natural environment. And you can see that in this picture here. This is a snowy plover chick, which I'll circle with my little pointer. And he, it, it is very well camouflaged to this piece of wood that it decided to hide behind. And those guys are very tiny. They're about the size of a cotton ball with two Q-tips for legs and they are extremely hard to spot. And so if a chick can get hidden, it's got a really good chance of survival. So they're very well adapted to this environment and they just need a little help from us to survive in the face of the beach caused alterations. And so what can we do on a large scale to help the snowy plovers? We accomplish this through agency management and agency management is multi-pronged and one of the biggest aspects of what they do is habitat restoration. And so this is a picture of New River Spit down in, I believe, Coos or Curry County. And this is a picture of a habitat restoration area. So you can see the river runs along and then goes out to the beach. And then you've got this kind of donut looking thing of grass. Well, in the center here is the bear area and that's actually the habitat restoration area. And so what the agencies did, and there's multiple agencies involved in this, including the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the U.S. Forest Service, 
the Bureau of Land Management, the Army Corps of Engineers, and Oregon State Parks, among others, they come along and they bulldoze this big grassy, what would be a big four dune without the work that they did. And then they create these little gaps that you can see in that grass. And once they've created this habitat, it's very attractive to snowy plovers. And the snowy plovers can come in and use that habitat because it very closely mimics their natural habitat. The other thing that this habitat restoration does is it opens up this area to access to the water line. And so when we get big storms in the winter and we get large storm surges and tides, it can potentially actually overwash these areas, which will maintain these areas and can also potentially wash away more of that grass, creating more of that snowy plover habitat. The second aspect of agency management is recreation management and keeping, keeping people out of snowy plover nesting areas. And they do this by implementing seasonal restrictions to beaches that snowy plovers are known to nest at. So you can see some signage here and it's pretty hard to see in the background, but there's a series of little tiny posts that have ropes around them. And those ropes are marking the area where the snowy plovers nest and those ropes are meant to keep us out of there. And they're just trying to give the birds a little bit of space to be able to nest in peace. These restrictions are in effect on plover beaches from March 15th to September 15th. So we're less than a month away from the restrictions being lifted actually, but they only affect about 14% of the entire Oregon coast. So there's lots and lots of beaches and lots of wonderful, beautiful areas on the Oregon coast that you can go out to and not have to be worried about running into snowy plovers or disturbing snowy plovers. And so we just ask that if you end up on one of these plover beaches that you share the beach. And the ways that you can do this are by staying down low in the wet sand down by the, down by the ocean and by keeping dogs off of these beaches. And we all know dogs love to walk on the beaches and, and run around, but unfortunately they're very fast and they're very good at running down, particularly juvenile plovers and plover chicks. And fortunately in Oregon, compliance is really pretty good, which is great news. The third aspect of agency management is, in, is an integrated predator management plan. And this is multifaceted in and of itself. A couple of things that the agencies do are trash removal from the beach and burying washed up carcasses, particularly things like sea lions or seals, because these types of things can attract those synanthropic predators that we talked about earlier. And we wanna keep those predators as far away from the plover nesting areas as we possibly can. Another aspect of this integrated predator management are what we call exclosures. And these exclosures are these wire cages that you can see in this picture here. And I think this is us setting up one of those wire cages. And the way that these work is by completely surrounding the plover nest on every side and from above. And so the plovers really prefer to walk around on the beach when you're out there. If you've ever gone out there and watched them, you probably noticed that. And so they're actually able to walk through these little gaps in the wire mesh to get back and forth to their nests as they need to. These exclosures do increase nest success or the amount of eggs that hatch, but unfortunately the chicks are precocial and want to leave that nesting area as soon as possible. And so once they do, they're completely exposed to potential predation. Another negative aspect of these exclosures that we have found is that there is a loss of adults associated with these nest exclosures. And we'll see in a few minutes that adult survival is very important to population growth. And so because of those reasons, we've used fewer and fewer of these exclosures over time. And in fact, now I don't believe we're using any currently. So the final aspect of the integrated plover management, and you've probably heard about this in the news recently was spotted in barred owls, is lethal predator removal. They've been removing barred owl and spotted owl nesting ranges because of predation and other interaction issues. And they've shown uh, recently that it's been very successful in helping 
to slow the the population decreases in spotted owls. And 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 just as in spotted owls, this has worked very well in continuing and decreasing the population declines in snowy plovers and actually has helped to increase the population of snowy plovers. And so this type of predator management not only improves nest success, but it also improves chick survival and fledgling survival. And this predator management is very targeted and, and is very selective and, and is going only after animals like this raven that we see here that are actually in snowy plover nesting areas. And so you can see in that picture that raven has an egg in its beak right now. And so it's it's very selective, but it's also very effective. And because we do not want to see ravens eating all the snowy plover nests, we want to have both of those species in Oregon. So this intensive management over the years has been extremely successful in Oregon. As I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, there were only 50 plovers on the entire Oregon coast, and they were mainly restricted to Lane, Douglas, and Coos counties, with a few birds in northern Curry counties. And back when I started birding, it was pretty hard to see a snowy plover, and you had to go to these very specific spots and hope that you might come across one. But thanks to the intensive management, that has all changed. And today, there are well over 600 plovers on the Oregon coast, and they're actually nesting in all Oregon coastal counties. So all the way up here at Clats of Spit and all the way down into the middle of Curry County. So we've not only been able to grow the population with management, but we've been able to expand its distribution. And it's now much closer to historic conditions before the introduction of that beach grass and those other issues that we talked about. So while although the snowy plover has not met its recovery goals in other parts of its coastal range, Washington and California, in Oregon, we have actually met those recovery goals and we have more than doubled them, which is really a cool thing and has really been a great thing to be part of over the years. And so now that we've met those goals, one of the questions that we have is, can we maintain those populations with less effort? And this is a question that, that the agencies have for us. And so we're asking things like, what life stages contribute most to population growth? which management actions are the most important and how can we basically get the most bang for our conservation buck? Because if we're able to take some of that funding, we can potentially move that funding over to other species that are declining on Oregon and are of greater conservation need. So in order to figure this out, we want to look at population growth rate. Population growth rates are controlled by this little bide, uh, name that she came up with, but basically births, immigration, deaths, and immigration. And snowy plovers don't have a lot of immigration or immigration. So really, we're mostly looking at birth rates and death rates to come up with these numbers. So that leads to a whole list of research questions. Why environmental variables and management actions affect the plover at each life stage? What is the contribution of each life stage to population growth? And how do these variables affect overall population viability? <clears throat> and so these are the four life stages of the snowy plover. And we have nest survival, which basically is saying what, how many nests, how many eggs are going to make it until they hatch. We have chick survival, which is how many chicks are going to make it until they reach the fledglings and, and, and what's going to affect that. Then we have juvenile survival. How many of those fledglings are going to survive over the winter till the next year to breed again? And adult survival. How many adults are going to be able to come back year after year to breed again in Oregon? So there's a bunch of variables that we call covariates that can affect those life stages. And we are most interested in looking at the management variables, which include habitat restoration, the use of those exclosures or wire cages and predator man management, because those are things that we can control. But we also want to look at the environmental variables, such as which site they're at on the Oregon coast, what year, because there's variation from year to year, the seasonality, whether you're looking at summer or winter, for example, 
the age of the parent because older parents typically know how to do it better. Population size with bigger populations, you tend to attract more predators, whether it's a male or a female, which can females lay eggs and males do not. So that can affect their survivability over the year. And the El Nino index, because that has a big impact on what the winter is going to look like. And so in order to do this and get these numbers calculated, we look at mostly productivity and survival because those were the two important factors. Remember, For productivity, the way we do that is by going out to these snowy plover nesting areas and running surveys by doing transects and locating all of the snowy plover nests that we can locate. Then we repeatedly visit those nests to determine the fate of those nests and whether or not they're surviving and for how long they're surviving. And this intensive type of monitoring of nesting has been going on in Oregon for 32 years since 1990. To understand survival, we actually go out and we command the adults and the chicks snowy plovers. And this allows us to have a unique set of color bands on an individual bird to where we can actually recognize them by individuals. Currently, we have about 80% of the population color banded in Oregon, and that number has been going down over the years as we have had an increasing population and moved more to a sampling scheme to where everything is not being banded. And we have a solid 25-year data set of these color marked birds, and we're able to use that data set and put it into a modeling program on the computer that accounts for survival and detection called MARC. And it, MARC is a computer program that is meant specific, specifically for this type of analysis. And so when you put that information into MARC, you're creating these encounter histories. And these encounter histories, we have an example of four different birds here with ones and zeros. Well, the ones mean that the bird was observed during that survey period, and a zero means that that bird was not observed during that period. And you can see, we don't always see the bird during the survey, even though it was still alive. And so Mark helps us take these encounter histories and then calculate detectability. And so this allows us to know if a bird or the population of birds is alive, even if we're not seeing all of those birds on every visit. And <clears throat> once we have all of that information, we're able to analyze the data and we're able to figure out how those covariates or those variables affect each life stage of the snowy plover. So I won't go through all of these, but you can see for each life stage, different factors affect each life stage differently. So for nest survival, the site is very important. Predator management is very important. The use of exclosures is important which HRA it is at is important, the season is important, whereas juvenile survival, really only year and predator management is important. But what's important about this chart is that highlighted in black on every single life stage of the snowy plover is predator management improves overall survival at those life stages. Adult survival is highlighted in yellow because we found that adult survival was the most important metric for population growth. And with a species, you are always going for population growth. So that leads us to a chart here on adult survival and the use of exclosures. I mentioned earlier that those exclosures can have a negative impact on adult survival. And we can see that here. This blue line is showing adult survival from year to year, while this green dotted line is showing the use of nest exclosures year per year. Per year. And you can pretty easily see that there's a strong, <clears throat> excuse me, correlation, a strong negative correlation between nest exclosures and adult survivals. So in other words, the more exclosures you use, the lower adult survival is in that year. And for this reason, we have curtailed largely the use of those exclosures and have relied more on predator management, which as we just discussed, improves all life stages of snowy plover survival. So this red arrow here shows the year that we introduced predator management. And you can see a pretty steady, consistent 
increase in adult survival to where it's now at its highest point ever with the use of predator management. So we wanted to take all of this information and do some projecting of population growth into the future. And so we run a bunch of stochastic models that give different population trajectories. And this is because the model is randomly selecting different vital rates based on the mean and the variability in those estimates that we're making. And it's kind of hard to see, but this little dark line right here is actual plover population. It's actually the male population in Oregon. But what's important is that you can see that black line pretty closely matches the average of our estimates. And so when we ran these estimates out to 2029 and got the average, we found that we would get around 473 adult males in Oregon. And if you're assuming a 50-50 sex ratio, which we have in Oregon, that's about 946 adults, which is a, a substantially higher number than the 600 adults that we currently have now. <clears throat> so in conclusion, Adult survival is the most important vital rate overall for population growth. It actually affects population growth more than having higher productivity or a larger number of hatched eggs and chicks. And predator management is beneficial to all life stages of the snowy plover and is likely the most effective tool for over pop overall population growth. Meanwhile, exclosures have a strong benefit to nest survival or productivity, but again, that's not the most important metric and it has a weak negative effect on adult survival. So really we're going to do the best using predator management and not the use of exclosures in the long run to continue the, ten, the trend that we're on growing the population of snowy plovers. So if we continue this current trend, we can expect that in the future, the population of plovers in Oregon will continue to gradually grow. And that is it for my presentation tonight. Uh, I thank you all for coming and spending your time with me this evening. Uh, in closing, I will show a quick little video. This is another time lapse video, but at the bottom of the screen, in the middle of the screen, is a male snowy plover, and he is sitting on a nest that is about to hatch. So if you watch closely, you will see him and some chicks as he runs around. And what he's doing right now is as the chicks hatch, he's actually grabbing those large egg fragments and he is taking them away from the nest site because again, he wants to be cryptic as possible and he's just trying to hide it. And again, that was quick, so we'll do it one more time. And you can see the little chicks in the nest coming and going. They get very antsy waiting for their siblings to hatch and they wanna go around and try to find food. And so that gives us time for questions. And this is also a little pop quiz. And the pop quiz is how many snowy plovers can you find in this picture? Thank you so much, Daniel. That was awesome. We learned a lot of really cool stuff tonight. Um, I would like to encourage folks to hop back on camera at this time. If you want to ask some questions, that would be great. Um, if you are more comfortable typing your questions into chat, I can read them out for you, but otherwise, um, just, just go ahead. Daniel, early, er, pretty early in your presentation, you said that the, that the males, that the females would sit on the nest in the daytime and then the males at, at night. Or, that have, is correct. Well, I didn't even realize they foraged at night. So, so whoever is not on the nest is actually foraging at night? Typically, yes. And uh, not only do they, they change day and night and like that, but through our camera work, we have actually found that the male will come at about lunchtime or high noon, and he'll actually relieve the female plover mid incubation duties and allow her to go out and forage during the daytime. So while I said the males sit on it primarily at night, they actually do sit on it during the daytime a little bit as well. And it's kind of neat to see them do their little exchange. They have this whole little ritual they do. We do have some questions typed into the chat, so I'm gonna read them now. Um, Nancy Thomas asks, are the areas for predator management going to be expanded to new counties? 
N not that I'm aware of. Um, the, the predator management is just focused on the core sites and those core sites are those sites that you saw on the, the slide that showed where snowy plovers are at. So that's gonna, as far as I know, remain in Lane, Douglas Coos and Northern Curry counties. Kelly, they, do put in, they do put in, um, they do restrict beach access on some of those other beaches. So if a snowy plover is found in what they call designated critical habitat, and, and there's, a, there's a whole plan for this and a document for this, that if they're found in these areas, they do rope those areas off, but no predator management that I'm aware of. Kelly wants to know what about the enclosures causes the adult mortality? Um, they are exclosures, not enclosures. We're trying to keep stuff out of the, the nest, not the birds in on the nest. Um, and so what happens in that scenario is it's primarily an issue with avian predators, things like harriers, which are at pretty unnaturally high levels on the coast now because of the, the European beach grass. That, that European beach grass creates that big foredune, which allows a deflation plane to be created behind that foredune, which is marsh habitat, which looks nothing like that picture I showed you of what good snowy plover habitat looks like, but it is very good habitat for harriers. Um, and other things like peregrine falcons and even great horned owls, those deflation planes eventually go through succession to where forest is able to grow right behind the foredune. And these aerial predators spot an adult sitting on a nest and they try to sneak up on it and do a sneak attack. And when that happens, the snowy plover's best defense, even though they like to walk away, is to fly away as rapidly as possible. Because in these scenarios with prey species, if you can stay above a predator like a peregrine or a harrier, you're very likely to stay alive. But if you get below a predator, they're much likely more likely to nab you out of the air. And so you may have seen this if you've seen any, any of these predator chases. We saw one on the Lane County Audubon walk a few years ago at the South Jetty where a peregrine came and tried to attack a wandering tattler. And the tattler was able to gain altitude and get above the peregrine. And it started to circle up and up and up into the sky. And that peregrine eventually had to give up because it really needed to be above that bird to be able to get that bird. And so what happens in these exclosures is that when they get attacked by one of these avian predators, their instinct is to fly away, but those cages make it to where they can't fly away and they end up bouncing around in that cage and then eventually figure out, okay, I can't fly away, so I need to try to run away. But unfortunately, by that point, it's generally too late and the predator is able to pretty quickly nab them. So I've got a couple questions that might be related. Um, Kevin wants to know what does predator management mean in practice? And Beverly wants to know how are the corvids killed? Maybe those go hand in hand. Um, well, predator management is, is multi-pronged, remember. It's more than just the lethal predator removal. Um, so doing things like the trash removal and the burying of carcasses is also predator management. And so we're trying to do everything that we can to not attract those predators out there in the first place. Because one of the problems is because of the loss of habitat, the introduction of that beach grass, it has drastically shrunk the areas where the plovers are able to nest. And so when predators do come along, they're able to very easily focus in on those small areas and then very efficiently wipe out those areas. And so some of our habitat restoration areas can, we, we might have, 10, 15, or 20 nests in those areas, and, and a raven or a harrier can come along and clear those out in just a few days, which is pretty dramatic. Um, as far as how the predators are removed, uh, that is conducted by Wildlife Services of APHIS, and they have a variety of methods, um, including trapping and shooting, um, and also just trying to, they, you know, they, they'll always try to get rid of those predators in other ways before they lethally re remove them. So they might haze them in a variety of ways, including shooting at them or just chasing them out of the area. And that, that's primarily how they do it. 
but that's not something we do. And so I'm not super well versed in that. Beverly says, I'm frustrated by dog walkers ignoring or not seeing the signs at Halem Bay State Park. Can we add, I lost it. Can we add other markers? Um, that could potentially happen, but that is a question for Oregon State Parks. They are in charge of that area up in the Halem State Bay. And I suspect they could do things, but they're also limited in, in the restrictions that they can make. And the, the big question is whether or not that is what I mentioned before, an area that is critical habitat. And I do believe the Halen Bay is critical habitat. My work is very focused on the core clover sites in Lane, Douglas, and Coos counties. Yeah, I, I, I see that a little bit on Bay Ocean Spits, you know, as yes. well. But I, I think because the because the markers are all above the high tide line and people are usually walking at, at lower tide. I, yeah, I think it's hard for them to see and, and, and you can't really place anything below the high tide line right. It'll just get washed away. Yeah, it's kind of a catch 22. And we've had a lot of that happen this year. Uh, we've had unusually high tides throughout the summer this year. Generally after spring, the tides will kind of mellow out, but but just this week we've had tides all the way up to the foredoon. And unfortunately, you know, all those ropes and signs and posts are, cost a lot of money and, and that money's got to come from somewhere. And so they don't want to lose those if they don't have to. And so, yeah, it's, it's a constant balancing act. And that's, that's kind of how it is in conservation biology in general. Yeah, now you, yeah you mentioned that, um as the population has expanded mostly northward uh you're not doing as much of the sort of daily tracking of nests and populations and so on is that because there's way there's a lot more plovers per person than there used to be i mean your team i think is the same size as it was 15 years ago that's exactly correct our team is the same size that it has been for probably the last 25 years and uh, there's a big difference put in, and just on our core sites, we actually have 550 plovers. And so the North Coast has, is pretty sparsely populated still. It's somewhere between 50 and 100 plovers. We actually don't have a very accurate estimate of the population on the North Coast. But yeah, it really, it, it all comes down to money. And, you know, there's only so much money to hire so many of us to monitor these birds. And so currently Portland Audubon has a program going where they are doing volunteer monitoring on the North Coast. And they hired a coordinator this year and she's very experienced in plovers. And I think that they'll get some good results this year with the efforts that they're making. Um, Steven asks, the average age is 2.9 years. Is the median age similar? Uh, I don't have a I don't have a median age off the top of my head. Okay, and I Nancy, do, I do believe the average is the mean. Okay, Nancy Thomas asks, "Do snowy plovers have a good sense of smell?" Asking because I would be interested to know if natural scents on the eggs or around the nest may be a way to discourage corvids from preying on the eggs. Has any research that been done on this? That is actually not an, not known. We just don't know if snowy plovers have a sense of smell or not. Um, I was able to write a conservation assessment for ODFNW this winter, and so I did pretty extensive research on the primary literature that is available out there for snowy plovers, and and sense of smell has never been tested in them, so we just don't know. I suspect that they do have a sense of smell. There's that old lifestyle that birds don't smell anything. Um, but we have shown in the studies that have been done and things like seabirds and other species that a lot of birds actually have a very good sense of smell. Does anybody else have any questions that they would like to ask? Are the corvids attracted by the scent or do they see the eggs? The, there. You know that? It depends on the type of corvid you're talking about. Um, ravens are, are, are kind of super predators compared to crows, for example. And so generally the way it works with crows is that crows are attracted out to the sites because a lot of our sites are pretty close to things like campgrounds and parking lots, which have a constant source of garbage. 
and crows love to pick through the garbage. And when there's no garbage to pick through, they'll start going out to the beach and picking through the rack line on the beach. And if they're not finding anything in the rack line on the beach, then they'll go into the nesting areas. And they kind of operate kind of how we do when we're surveying for plovers. They just walk around in zigzags until they get lucky, really. Um, so I think they're primarily a visual predator. And ravens operate in an entirely different way. They are much, much more efficient. And they're actually also a visual predator. And generally the way they hunt a snowy plover nesting area is by flying over it. And they'll usually do a straight line because they can cover a whole nesting area in a minute or less because they're such fast flyers. But what they're doing is they're looking for the adult female to get up and run off of her nest when she spots them. And then they cue in actually not onto the adult female because they, they're not good at catching her, whereas the harrier might cue in on her and try to catch her first. And so they'll go right to that spot where they saw the female plover run. And oftentimes that spot is exactly where the nest is. So oftentimes when we find a nest that's depredated by raven, all the only evidence that we'll see at the nest is a set of two raven tracks right at the nest, right where it landed. They'll gulp eggs, they won't leave any sort of egg evidence or anything, and they'll just swallow them or they'll carry them away to cache them for later. So they're, they're very effective predators. Uh, something that uses scent to detect snowy plover nets is something like a coyote. And there is a whole interesting interaction between coyotes and harriers, which are, again, both species that are in, in unusually high numbers because of, of human caused alterations. And so a harrier is a visual predator and they'll try to get adults, they'll try to get chicks, they'll try to get fledglings, they'll, you know, they'll eat whatever they can catch. But if they're not able to catch the adult, they're also smart like a raven and they'll go back to that spot where they flush the adult. And then they'll actually eat the eggs. They're not very good at eating the eggs like a raven is. They've got these, you know, these big hooked bills and so they'll usually just kind of pierce into the egg at the nest site, and then they'll try to lap up the egg, like the, the egg contents, the yolk or the chick that's in there. And they'll leave a big mess when they do that. Well, then Mr. Coyote comes at night and he and he's sniffing around and he's like, oh, what's this interesting mess? There's some some leftover egg here. This looks tasty. Let's let's lap this up. And then they get the idea, you know, if I start looking around, I might find more of these eggs. And so it's kind of a learned behavior in coyotes, but they do use scent to, to, to learn that behavior. Daniel, do you have an answer as to how many plovers are in that photo? I they do have, have an answer. And that's, several the, guesses. that's my next slide, which I, I hope you're still seeing. Oh, oh, oh. Here we go. Uh, so that has all of the plovers circled in it now, so you can see them much easier. And we count 14 snowy plovers, and I hope we're right. I have not been able to find any that we could not find. So uh, if uh, anybody got that right, they win the prize. They can come visit me on the beach sometime, and I will show them a snowy plover. Wow. Secret visits. <laughs> Um, does anybody else have any any questions before we wrap up for the night? Um, I, was, I was wondering about what the um, uh, what the what the size of the 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 territory, you know, for snow plovers. Is. I mean, I've never seen fourteen, yeah, you know, at once. Uh, I've you know only at most seen uh, you know two up in the uh, the Bay Ocean Spit uh, area. So so I'm curious, yeah, like like what what is the spacing of the nests typically um, expected to be? We, we've never actually studied that exact spacing in Oregon. Um, we do consider them to be semi-colonial species. So they actually do like to nest around each other. Um, and so it kind of depends on how large of a nesting area you have and how many birds you have in that nesting area. Some of our small sites, um, that are maybe only a third to a half mile long can have upwards of 20 to 25 pairs in them. So they have relatively small areas that, um, that they nest in. And, but it's really interesting because they'll often divide that space up like, like very 
dramatically. Like, and so as you go down the beach and you have a nesting area back behind you, you'll often see the same birds kind of in the same sequence on that stretch of beach. And so they, they defend their areas pretty aggressively. But once they're away from their nest, if they don't have chicks, they pretty regularly like to intermingle with each other and they like to flock together because flocking provides another form of safety from predators. And so generally when they're out foraging, they'll all be hanging out together. And, and so sometimes when we're going down the beach, we might see five or 10 males just hanging out together and we call those little bachelor parties. And they're not really bachelor parties, but they're actually just males that have nests and they're just all out foraging together. And then what you're seeing in this picture with the 14 birds is actually a, a post breeding picture. And so after the breeding season, they really like to flock up and they actually form pretty large flocks. I think our largest flock that we've ever counted was at Silk Coos and that flock had over 80 birds in it at one point during the winter. And actually now is a great time to go out to some of these beaches and see some of those wintering flocks. So uh, I'll mention Silk Goose again as a great place to see snowy plovers right now. Uh, their nesting is complete, particularly along the north side of the river. And the, the flock there has been somewhere in the 30 bird range right now. And so if you, if you go to the parking lot at the very end and then you walk up and over the hill, you can walk down the beach and look for the plovers. And they're most often up in that rack line. They like to hang out where they have a lot of debris to hide. And so any of the areas where you see big patches of shell, you're likely to find plovers. Unless it's a lower tide, that's when they'll often go down to the water line to feed. So that's always a great time to look for plovers is in the morning during a low tide, particularly the minus tides when it exposes more of that beach. Sometimes that flock ends up on the south side of the river and they're a little harder to find, but, but nevertheless, they're actually, they are there right now, whether you find them or not. We've got several folks in here that are, that are Portland based. Do you have any recommendations for beaches up around Portland that have a good amount of snowies? I think that uh, is Spot. I don't know what the conditions of there are right now as far as flocking, um, but they had a pretty good amount of breeding birds this year from what I have heard. Uh, again, that's not one of my normal study areas, and so I'm not privy to what's going on up there. Um, but I was up there in March when things were getting first getting underway for the nesting season, and there was definitely a good population there. And I, I can't exactly describe how to get to that spot, but it was. It was um, just north of the jetty there. Did you just mention Clatsop Spit? You kind of broke up. I did, Clatsop Spit. Yeah, north of the jetty at Clatsop Spit. Yeah, you have to go to the parking area. It's kind of like um, you don't go all the way to the parking area D. It's between C and D. There's a little inlet. Um, where there's some construction going over some railroad tracks, probably maybe less than an eighth of a mile or so uh, west of the parking area D. And then you can, you can access the beach there. You, people do drive on the, the beach, not at the snowy plover area, although some do, but um, to go fishing and such, there's access there between C and D, really close to D. That sounds very familiar from my memories of March. Yeah, awesome. and thank you. We saw 14 there uh, in April. Awesome. So Nancy was asking about in a contact email, but I'm unsure if she means like a, a work email for you or for maybe one of those organizations you were talking about contacting with other questions. Um, I can I can type my work contact email into the chat. Cool. If that works. All right. Hopefully everybody can see that. Oh, yeah, I think I sent that directly to you, not the group. Oh, you did. Try again. <laughs> There we go. This has been a great program, Daniel. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks, everybody, for coming.
Yeah, thanks so much, Daniel. And folks, if anybody here is interested in having a presentation themselves, or if you have any topics in particular that you would like to see covered, please reach out to me. Thank and you. that's it for the night. Have a great night. All right, everybody. Thanks, Bye. Thanks.